Today we're going to start our first biological unit called biochemistry. Now if we break this word down using those prefixes that we've been studying, we can get an idea of what this word means. Bio meaning life, chemistry meaning pertaining to chemicals. So these are going to be the chemicals of life. But before we can start to study those basic chemicals that we're going to be breaking down and really getting into, we need to get a very basic understanding of chemistry. So let's start right at the beginning, really small, with the smallest working unit known as the atom. The atom is the basic functioning unit of all things in existence. All things, both living and non-living. So atoms make up you and dirt and your desk and even the air that is all around us. Even though we can't fill it, it's made of atoms. It's made of these little tiny things. So what do you need to know about the atom? You need to know what it's made of, what those things, electrical charges are, and where can you find those things. Okay? So what is an atom made of? It has three basic parts. The proton, the electron, and the neutron. Okay? So what are these guys' electrical charges? Protons are positive. That's an easy one to remember. P and P. Protons are positive. The opposite of a proton is an electron because electrons have a negative charge. Okay. Now, with electricity, opposites attract. So positives and negatives attract to each other. They want to get close together. So protons and electrons want to get together and hang out. And the same charge is repellent. So protons want to get away from other protons because positives want to get away from positives. Okay? Our third part is known as a neutron. And neutrons are neutral. They're neither positive nor negative. They just have no electrical charge at all. This again is another easy one to remember because neutrons are neutral in and in. So two of them are easy to remember. So if you can remember two, the third one will be the leftovers. So protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and then the leftovers, electrons are negative. So where can I find these parts of an atom? The two that have those easy memory devices live together. The positive protons and the neutral neutrons live together in the middle of the atom. They live in an area called the nucleus, which is in the center. And then the electrons are left out. They are constantly moving, flowing around the nucleus in constant motion. Okay? All right, so that is an individual atom. Let's get a little bit bigger. Let's put a bunch of the same atom together. What do we have? This is known as an element. An element is a pure substance, meaning there's no mixing going on. Every single atom in a sample of element has the same identity. Those three parts, the proton, neutron, and electron, they make up the identity of an atom, who it is. They also determine how they will interact with other atoms when they come close which we'll talk about in a minute. So your elements can be found on the periodic table. If you look to the front of the classroom, there is a small yellow periodic table available for you if you are interested. So I'm going to pause for a moment, and I want you to just think to yourself and try to come up with a few examples of elements or types of atoms. Okay, hopefully you were able to come up with a few of the common ones, like silver and gold, copper, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, helium, something like that. There's over 200, so hopefully you came up with a few other than the ones that I gave as well. Some atoms or elements 
are naturally unstable. They have really, really large nuclei, and they don't have a good ratio of protons to neutrons to electrons, which, and that's important because of those positives and negatives. And so their nuclei are unstable. They break down or decay. When an atom breaks down or decays, it releases a huge amount of energy. And that energy, if not used correctly, can be really dangerous. But we have found some ways to use this radiation to our advantage. For example, we can use it to date very old items such as fossils, rocks, and ancient artifacts like arrowheads and pottery. Since these radioactive nuclei break down in a reliable, consistent pattern, we can use it to calculate how old an atom is by how many are left. We can also use it to treat diseases. You may have heard of people taking chemotherapy or having to have radiation. This is where we direct this radiation, this high energy being released by these unstable nuclei as they break down at a specific spot in the human or animal body. And we can use it to treat cancer and shrink and even kill tumors. We can also use it to tag something and see it travel through the body. So you can get an injection of a radioactive isotope and then get into like an MRI machine and they can watch that radioactive isotope as it travels through your veins. This is one way that they can look for clots in the body, which can be very bad. Let's get a little bit bigger now. So we've talked about an element, which is pure. It's only one type of atom together. Well, what about if we want to combine two or more different atoms? When we do that, they're called compounds. Compounds are chemically connected, so they are joined with one another. Here are some examples of the three most important compounds for biology. There's water, which is H2O. That means that there are hydrogens and oxygens in water. H for hydrogen, O for oxygen. The little two that you see there next to the hydrogen tells you how many hydrogens. So it's H2O because every single water has two hydrogens and only one oxygen. Notice there is no little one next to the O. The one is understood. You only do numbers two and above. Next we have carbon dioxide, CO2. One carbon, two oxygens for every carbon dioxide. If I wanted a sample of carbon dioxide, where could I get it? Think for a moment. Every time you exhale or breathe out, you are breathing out some carbon dioxide. So if I wanted to collect a sample of carbon dioxide, I could just blow into a balloon and I would have lots of carbon dioxide. Okay, uh, the third one down there, glucose, is C6H12O6. That's a big one. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens per one glucose. Glucose is a sugar that is made by plants during the process of photosynthesis. Make sure that you know these three. Make sure that you can match that water equals H2O and glucose is C6H12O6 because you may see that as a question sometime soon. Okay. There are two ways that compounds can be held together by a chemical bond. You have ionic bonds. This is when you give and take electrons. Okay. This is a little bit weaker of a bond, and it causes one to be a little bit more positive and one to be a little bit more negative. So because one's positive and the other's negative, they hang out together. Covalent bonds are when they share their electrons. This is a tighter bond because the two atoms are going to hold together really tight to make sure one doesn't steal one of the electrons. Next step up 
we have a mixture. A mixture is when you combine two or more elements or compounds. Now, when we make a mixture, you're physically mixing them together, so they're side by side mixed in, but they're not chemically combined, so they're not bonded together. So, for example, you can mi make a mixture of salt and pepper. It's still just salt and pepper, and you can separate out salt and pepper, but they are mixed together. Same thing with sand and sugar. You can mix it together, but it's still sand and sugar, and you can separate them if you want to. A very special type of mixture that we'll be using in this class is a solution. With a solution, everything that's mixed in is evenly distributed, so it looks the same all the way throughout. For example, if you put sugar in your coffee, sugar is a solution of the coffee, the water, the sugar, and maybe even some milk. But when you stir it up, it looks the same color all the way throughout. Okay? There's two important parts to a solution, the solute and the solvent. The solute is the part that is being dissolved. The solvent does the dissolving. So if you're making sugar water at work, the sugar is the solute and the water is the solvent. In biology, the solvent is almost always water. And we'll finish up today by talking about the pH scale. The pH measurement of something is to determine how acidic or basic it is. The more acidic something is, the more hydrogens it has in it. The more basic it is, the more OH ions it has in it. Okay? So the more H's you add, the stronger of an acid it is. The pH scale, as you see here, goes from 0 to 14. Right in the middle of the scale is 7. A measurement of 7 is a perfect neutral. The only substance that we know of that has a pH of 7 is pure filtered water with nothing in it. Just pure water is exactly a 7. It is neither an acid nor a base. Or rather, it is both an acid and a base. Anything below 7 is an acid. So small numbers are acids. 0 to 6.9, you have an acid. Big numbers are bases. So 7.1 to 14 is a base. The further away that you get from 7 makes you stronger. So for example, if I had two acids, one has a pH of 1, the other has a pH of 4. pH 1 is a stronger acid because it's further away from 7. On the other side with bases, if I have a base of pH 9 and a base of pH 13, pH 13 is a stronger base because it's further away from 7. Both strong acids and strong bases can be harmful because they can corrode materials. Some examples of common acids are vinegar, soda, battery acid, stomach acid, some examples of common bases are any household cleaner, so oven cleaner, Windex, bleach, these are all bases. Okay? Acids are very sour and feel kind of sticky. Bases are tart and they feel very slippery. Okay? A really important concept for you to know about is the word homeostasis, which is maintaining a stationary balance. And pH is one thing that living things need to maintain in homeostasis. If your blood gets out of whack and is too acidic, your organs could start to die, and then you could eventually die. So it's very important for pH to, rem to remain in a specific homeostasis mode, which we will learn about more when we learn about what all an acid can do to it.